So glad you're here today. Let's bow our heads and, and pray as we prepare ourselves for the message today. Lord Jesus, we thank you that, that your grace is enough and that your praise is on our lips. God, I pray for those folks who are here today who are having a hard time praising. That your spirit will testify to their spirits exactly the way that they need it. So that they know that you are greater than that which is consuming them this morning. Lord, I pray that through the power of your Holy Spirit, you will weave in and through and among us all. Testifying to the abundance of your grace. And that you'll do the same in and through me. So that I might be your vessel. But if I get in the way, Lord, I pray that you will use me or work in spite of me. Lord, will you have your way? This is your time and we are your people. So come Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, so as we get started, I want you to think about something. For all of those who are uh, teenagers and, and older, maybe you're in your 20s or above now, I want you to think about this. How has your life turned out the way you thought it would when you were a teenager? Yeah, right? So how has your life turned out the way that you thought it would when you were a teenager? I can tell you that, I, I think I can speak for Michelle, that when Michelle and I were 18, she and I both never anticipated that we would be married when we were 21. I mean, that wasn't on my radar, it wasn't on her radar, but you know, when you find the right person, you just do it, right? That's right, baby. All right, so we didn't know that that was going to take place, nor did, I didn't know when I was a teenager that I would end up having two generations of kids in my household. That was pretty fun. And then, I, you know, I'd never even contemplated or thought about it. It was never on my radar. I had not been trained up to do it. I had not been set apart to do it. I had never desired it. But I never dreamed when I was a teenager because it never even entered my mind that I would become a pastor one day. I, that always thought pastors were pastors because they couldn't do anything else. And that's, I was like, wow, this is, this is the gig I've got now. All right, so... And I never dreamed that I would be a new church planter for 10 years down in Austin. That was just, I never even knew that was a thing. And so the dreams that you have when you're a teenager of things that will be when you grow up, that's neither positive nor negative. It's just, you can't anticipate everything, right? And some of it is positive and some of it is negative. I want you to think about your world. The things that you dreamed of when you were a teenager, did all of them come to pass? And some things that you never dreamed of have come to pass. Some of you never dreamed that when you were a teenager or in your 20s or even 30s that you would get pregnant out of wedlock. And some of the guys never dreamed that you would be the one causing someone to be pregnant out of wedlock. When you were a teenager, you never anticipated the job that perhaps you have had. Maybe you took a temporary job that would just get you through a season and that job ended up lasting you for 10 or 20 years. You may have had dreams to go to a certain college, but you end up going to a different college. You may have had dreams of having a certain job at some point, but you got a different job. You may have had a different idea of who the man or woman would be, that you would marry the type of person, what they would look like, what they would do, how they would act, how they would behave. And maybe you got something a little different. You see, those things that we anticipate when we're growing up as to what they might be when we get grown up, aren't always to be the case. And that's sometimes good and sometimes that's a negative. But just as I've experienced that, I know you have as well. And the great joy that I hope we have this morning is that a guy named Joseph has had the same experience as well. You know, Joseph in the biblical story, the one who found out from the one he was betrothed to named Mary that she was pregnant. And oh, by the way, it's not his baby. It's conceived by the Holy Spirit. You know that Joseph... The Joseph who had been raised up and he had learned to trade to be a carpenter, that's what we understand through scripture and tradition, that he was a carpenter, he worked with his hands, and that's what he knew growing up and probably what he had grown to expect, that, that those expectations that he had when he was a teenager of thinking about what his life would be, they got turned completely upside down when God moved in. And what he thought would happen with this woman that he was betrothed to got completely turned up 
on end when she came and said some certain things were happening that were so fantastical that it threw his life for a loop. Now, I want you to think about Joseph, because Joseph's story is not too different from ours in many ways. I want you to think about what is happening with Joseph as he gets this news where all of a sudden something drops in his lap, and what he thought was going to be is now different. So let me tell you a little bit of the story in Matthew chapter 1, and we're not going to have it up on the screen. This is a different translation, so I want you to hear this. Now, the birth of Jesus the Messiah took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Her husband Joseph, being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, planned to dismiss her quietly. But just when he had resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from, the, from their sins. When Joseph awoke from the dream, he did as an angel of the Lord had commanded him to do. Now, I want you to think about what Joseph was going through. This scripture reading sounds like it happened just like that. One minute he got the news that Mary was pregnant with a child that was on his own. The next moment he took a nap. The next moment an angel appeared. The next moment he awoke, and then everything was fine within a span of about five minutes. Because we can run through this really quickly. But that's actually not the case. Joseph is human, he experienced things like you and I do. So I want you to imagine the dark night of the soul that perhaps he was going through. You know what a dark night of the soul is? It's that spiritual struggle where something happens that's completely unexpected and not always in a positive way. And it's happened and you start wrestling. And your faith may have been leading you to to handle things just as life was just kind of going in an even keel according to your plans. But then something happens and it throws everything in disarray. And the dark night of the soul is where you're beginning to wrestle, like, where is God in all this? You ever ask that question? You know, I imagine Joseph asking the question, like, why is this even happening? Maybe Joseph was thinking, I'm a good person. I'm righteous. I mean, I I try to do the right thing, and I'm trying to do right by this girl. And she comes over with this weird idea that the baby in her belly is from God and why is this even happening? This is not the way I planned my life to be. And it's there in that dark night of the soul where, where Joseph was really trying to figure out who he was and to whom he belonged. And, and I think many of us, probably if we reflect, have gone through those dark nights of the soul. In fact, I, I, I want to share with you a graphic that many of you have seen. If you've ever gotten on the interwebs, you've probably seen this at some point. But I thought it was good to see today. You see our plan at the top. We think things are going to be a nice progression from point A to point B, and we try to stay in that lane, stay pretty safe. I mean, think about the plans that you've made this week over Christmas or for Christmas, or just recently in your life. You really don't like it when things go weird. You like to go from point A to point B with very minimal change and adaptation to your plans. If your plans get changed a little bit, some of you get freaked really out and it throws your whole world into chaos. But the reality is that our life isn't just a linear path from point A to point B unless you're just playing it super, super safe. Usually there's a bunch of hills and there's a bunch of valleys. There's a bunch of jagged rocks. Sometimes that's interspersed with mountaintop experiences. Sometimes you're going through wilderness where you can't see 20 feet ahead of you. Others of you, you're walking through desert where you can see 20 miles ahead of you, but there's no sustenance around you. You don't know if you can make it any longer. Y'all ever been in those situations? I have. When I was 20, I enlisted in the Army. Some of you may have heard this story. I enlisted in the Army. And to get into the Army, I had to get a height waiver. I'm not kidding. That's a real thing. I had to get a height waiver to get into the Army because they thought I was too tall. And I enlisted in the army, which millions of people have done. How many of you are veterans of the armed services? Hey, thank y'all. No one will ever clap for me because out the last week of boot camp, 
I, I couldn't pass the physical training test. Now, that was humiliating for me. My plan from point A to point B is that I was going to go in. Uncle Sam was going to pay for me to travel the world. Also, give me college money on the side. I would do my three or four year service. And then I would get all the benefit. And Uncle Sam, I would play him like a fool. And I would get all the benefit. I couldn't make it eight weeks. And I got kicked out. Because I couldn't pass the test. Now, I was 20 years old. That really disrupted my whole world. And instead of going from point A to point B, I went down into a dark valley. And I had to figure out exactly who I was. And this God who I said I believed in, just how far did I believe in him? Because I was going in ways that I never anticipated. And I was wondering, why would God lead me to such utter and public failure when I was a pretty good guy? I mean, especially when I compared myself to my friends. I mean, I was better than them, right? And so why, why would God allow that to happen? And you know what? God didn't make that happen. You know who made that happen? Me. Because I didn't prepare myself adequately. And so but going through that dark valley helped shape me. It helped refine me. It helped dig me deeper into exactly what I was placing my faith in. And up to that point, I was placing my faith completely and utterly in myself because there had been nothing else in my life that I'd ever failed at. School was pretty easy. I'd been on three years of varsity high school basketball at a 5A school. Not that I was any good, but I filled a spot. I mean, no struggle, no problems whatsoever. Everything that I'd ever done, I had succeeded at. Anybody else here in the room experience that? The greatest thing other than my wife and kids that have ever happened to me is me falling flat on my face because it's through those times in that dark night of the soul that I came to realize who God is and who I was in him. Up to that point, I'd made God in my own image and it faltered really quickly. But I want you to imagine what Joseph was going through. I think there's some things that we can learn about how God worked in and through Joseph's life that might be applicable to us today. The first thing is this, is that remember when he had that dream, the angel of the Lord came to him and said, do not be afraid. Now, for those of you who are living in fear right now, you've got those things that are scaring you out of your mind. Maybe you're coming up on Christmas and financial wherewithal or lack thereof is really beginning to freak you out. Maybe your marriage or your family relationship is really in chaos right now. And you may be sitting beside that person right now. And for all intents and purposes, everyone in this room thinks everything is fine because you're not causing a disturbance. But there's stony silence when you get in the car to go home. You don't play well with one another when you get to the house. There's a lot of sharp words and sharp edges. And that's not just an exception. That has become the rule. And you're afraid of what's going to happen. So for some of you, you're concerned about what's going to happen with your work. Because there's downsizing. There's upsizing. You're never sure exactly what's going to happen. And so you were living in fear. And what can end up happening is that fear is the God that you begin to worship, not Christ. Joseph was told in that moment as a righteous person who had grown up in the Jewish faith. When the angel said, do not be afraid, he was echoing words that he knew of his faith. If you go back to the story of Moses, when God came to Moses in the burning bush to say, look, I got a job for you to go back from where you came to lead my people out of bondage. The first thing he said to Moses is, Do not be afraid. Because encountering God is scary. Can I get an amen? Amen. Now, some of you have never encountered God because it scares you so much. But for those of you who have, you can probably attest with 100% authenticity, it'll knock you back on your heels. Do not be afraid is very appropriate. So he remembered that story. I would imagine so. And then as Moses was leading God's people out of Egypt into the wilderness, and as they were in the wilderness for a while, they kept on complaining, saying, cannot we go back to slavery? At least then we knew what to expect. And God spoke through Moses to tell God's people, don't be afraid. I got this. I've answered your prayers, and I'm leading you in the ways that you need to go. Just trust. So what is it that you fear today? that is actually stealing your trust of the Lord. I don't know what that is for you. 
But I found more often than not that we good Christian church folk, we actually live in fear, not faith. We're always afraid of what's going to slip through our fingers. But sometimes those things slipping through our fingers enable us to grab hold of Christ tighter. And you'll never realize that until that which you love, you have no control over anymore. Another thing we can learn from Joseph as he responds is that he understood that God was up to something. You remember when the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph, he said, look, this baby that you think is just a problem, something to get rid of, this girl who you think you need to discard in a private way, there's more going on than what you think. God is up to something. This, these prophecies, Joseph, that you know of, that you were raised on, that a virgin would give birth to the Messiah, this is not just theory anymore. This is happening in your own backyard. You, are, you have a front row seat to what is happening here. God is up to something, even through that chaos. We like to think that God only works when things are very nice and calm and are in accordance with our plans already. Well, can I tell you that many of the times the plans that we have don't have anything to do with the Lord. We make them because they seem good to us. But in the midst of that chaos, God is up to something. I want you to think about the chaos that you're in. You have some health chaos that you're experiencing right now. Financial chaos, family chaos. Maybe it's chaos with your faith. You're, you're going through that dark night of the soul trying to figure out where God is. You're here today. You're trying to be the good soldier, and you're here. You're putting yourself in the right spot at the right time, just trusting that you might walk out today with just a glimpse of the grace of the Lord. But can I tell you, like Joseph understood, is that God is up to something. Nothing that you do is wasted. Everything is redeemable. Can I say that again? Because I don't think you are seeing that through the eyes of faith. You're just seeing that through the eyes of your experience. Nothing is wasted. That thing that you are thinking about right now, nothing is wasted. Everything is redeemable. Nothing that you are going through right now is wasted. Everything is redeemable. The struggle that you have at your computer that you can't get away from at night when everyone else has gone to bed, nothing is wasted, and that is redeemable. You're spending money that your spouse doesn't know about, and you're trying to keep it on the down low before they find out, nothing is wasted. Everything is redeemable. That walk through the valley of the shadow of death where you feel like you're just dry bones, nothing is wasted. Everything is redeemable, including what you're going through right now. Jesus is your Lord. He is your Savior. He's inviting you to a life, and an abundant life at that. So this piecemeal, scarcity living, that's not what God created you for. God is up to something, if you will just respond. And that goes to the last thing that we can learn from Joseph. When Joseph awoke from this dream, you know what Joseph did? He acted on faith. What he wanted to do in the first place, he jettisoned that to do what the Lord had led him to do. He got up and he went back to Mary and he said, you're mine and I am yours. This whole thing is just crazy, but I'm leaning into trusting the Lord and I know that God is up to something. Now, when you think about your life, has there been anything ever that you've actually, because of your faith in Jesus and his leading, you've actually ever changed your plans as to what you were doing because the Lord was impressing upon you to change? There's a lot of good Christian folk out there who have never changed any of their plans or how they speak or how they plan or how they think or how they do things. They're not going to go that crazy with Jesus. But if Jesus is keeping them nice and safe and happy, then they assume that he's happy with everything that they're doing. But if you can look back on your recent history and you've never changed any of your plans or the way you've done things because the Lord has impressed upon you to do something, I want to encourage you to take a step back. Because you are not God's gift to humanity. Your stuff does stink. And if you look back on your life as a faithful person and God's never adjusted your plans and you've never responded to let him do that, then I ask and question just how faithful you are following Jesus. Because to say yes 
to what Jesus is prompting you to do means you've got to say no to something else. You know that, don't you? You cannot serve two masters. And as people of faith, one of the things we can learn from Joseph is that Joseph got up and he put aside what he first wanted to do, to go and do what the Lord was calling him to do, because that's where life was. Not in just fulfilling his plans and his ideas for life, but following the Lord's plans. He was living. He chose life. Will you choose him? In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and all God's people said...